Death, eternal punishment for anyone who opens this casket. The mummy, is it dead or alive? Human or inhuman? You'll know, you'll see. You'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end and brings a scream to your lips. <coughs> There's nothing on earth like the mummy. You will not remember what I show you now, and yet I shall awaken memories of love and crime and death. Now I know his horrible plan. He is going to kill her and make her a living mummy like himself. mummy film I was interested in, the only one I'd ever seen was the original of Boris Karloff. And it's funny because people started throwing other ideas at me as I was going on. They say, oh, do you have this in it? And do you have that in it? I said, no, where does that come from? They go, the mummy movies. And I, I was like, oh, I only watched the original. And in the original, Boris Karloff, he's only the mummy, you know, a, a mummy for the first scene. And the rest of the movie, he's Boris Karloff with like kind of little wrinkles. And people are so used to guys wrapped in bandages, you know, and that's what I, I wanted to get completely away from because that wasn't at all the intent or the, the look of the original, and that's not at all our look. He, from the very beginning, said, I don't want this to be like a mummy movie like we've seen in the past with the shuffling guy in bandages. This guy's got to be mean, he's got to be fast, and he's got to be dangerous. It's a movie for the 90s. And I said, okay, great, we can do that. <laughs> God, I hate it when these things do that. Is he supposed to look like that? No, I've never seen a mummy look like this before. He's, he's still... still... Juicy. Juicy. Yes. The great original mummy was made in 1932 at Universal Studios. And it, of course, inspired many sequels. There's a whole line of British movies that actually did it a lot of justice in their, in their way. And it's really been fun to bring that character back to Universal Studios. Yeah, we really are, are very proud of, of the fact that we're working on something that's considered to be a classic. You know, you just don't go out and remake a classic without putting everything you've got into it. And we've looked at the 1932 mummy. We have a good understanding of what made that story great in the first place. It was the one horror movie as a kid that scared the hell out of me. All the other ones, like Frankenstein, he was kind of tragic and sad, and Dracula was sexy and kind of cool. But the only one that really scared the hell out of me was the mummy. I don't know what it was about it, but it just petrified me as a kid, and I always remember certain moments in the mummy. I probably saw it when I was like eight years old on the television in black and white, and I've never forgotten it. I knew that being able to draw from those, that genre of filmmaking and couple it with what we have at our disposal here and today, given the advances in computer-generated technology and uh, um, the, the wonderful things that ILM can do. I think we could create a, recreate the mummy as um, a fierce and unique and somewhat sympathetic character. ILM has been there from the beginning. They've created most of this technology. 
they know what can be done, what they can't be done. And you can be assured if you give a pro something to ILM, they'll solve it. And then there was light. Hey. That is a neat trick. Every movie that we work on, we try to do something really new and exciting. That's kind of kind of our deal at ILM, you know. And so whatever project comes into us, we try to infuse it with something that, that we can bring to the movie. That's why people hire us, is we bring something to the film uh, above and beyond just great effects. Their knowledge and creativity is just spectacular. Uh, it's just above and beyond anything I expected. They always, they challenge me. I'm so used to asking people, can you give me this and this and that? And everybody's saying, well, how about just this? And at ILM, I say, can you give me this, this and that? And they said, okay, and how about this? And I'm very pleased with them. Our business here at Industrial Light and Magic is to help directors tell their stories. And so it's a bit of a fine line as we try to figure out what we have to bring to the table that's directly related to what they want to tell in their story without letting the visual effects dominate their story or take over their story or redirect their movie for the sake of visual effects. We always want the visual effects to serve the movie. This is a tremendous opportunity for us to do that because it's such a rich tapestry to work with. The entire design of the mummy and what we're doing with you know, the various stages of the mummy and the various mummies. It's very 90s. It's a, a lot of CG work. It's not, it's not a guy wrapped in bandages. No! You must not read from the book! Well, I think the special effects are going to help us create the magic of the mummy. Um, the creature, like I said, he's not a guy wrapped in bandages. This is a uh, full uh, an actor working with ILM, hand in glove. One of the uh, the advantages to having a creature like this designed in house by a character design group within ILM is that we have a close working relationship with the animators and the model builders and all of the CG team, development team, who are putting this thing together and we consult with them very regularly so that there's a real nice uh, creative and technical complementary relationship between the two sides. We are in serious trouble. We started looking for a way to make the most organic and interesting creature that we had ever produced at ILM. And that meant uh, working out ways of bringing complexity and interest to the look of the mummy. He couldn't be wrapped up in bandages, we knew that. He couldn't be really gory and awful and sort of slasher film like. We knew we didn't want that either. So we had to find somewhere in between that had all this really interesting and sort of nightmarish character, but uh, not go too far with it. One, one of the prerequisites for the movie was to try and stay away from something that was very gory and, uh, and realistic looking in that respect. No blood, no um, you know, uh, fluids, and, and the sense of, uh, of something that's really like cut, and it's, but more like um, a stylization of what uh, that body would be so that it you don't go oh what what is that when you see the the character but still is really striking and and uh, you know horrifying we started out sort of building from the skeleton up and adding in all different kinds of uh, of different anatomy to the character and then and then putting a bit of bandage here, a bit of bandage there and seeing what, what we liked. We started then showing these things to um, to Steve and, and having him react to what he liked. We went through uh, a, an enormous pile of, of concepts and designs with a, with a really tight team of artists here. Um, a variety of different styles were used in the initial brainstorming. We just threw a whole lot of different ideas at the director. This was done long before we'd ever found out who was being cast. Arnold Vosloo had not been cast yet, so we were drawing facial types that, uh, that would change quite a bit. So here you see different artists' takes on him growing back from a totally skin and bones mummy back to something a little bit more uh, evolved. You can see here he evolves a little bit more, treatments of him with more skin and the bandage. So from these he'd circle, I really like the mouth here, but can you combine it with the eyes here and the neck there? And we produced a hybrid version. Here's a drawing that was uh, the final, the final uh, evolution of the design process for his whole body. After we got the pencil drawings approved, we then went uh, 
went ahead to visualize stages three and four. And by this time, Arnold Vosloo had been cast, and we were able to get really good quality photographs of him. So these headshots were scanned into the computer. And using uh, com digital paint tools, I was able to paint all of this horrible desiccated rot onto him where he has not healed yet. This became uh, a test for the, the grossness threshold of this movie. We used this stage of the artwork and the computer tools to really develop the color, to play with the color, to keep it looking dry and dusty and rotted and not gory and bloody. That was the distinguishing thing we had to be very aware of here. And eventually we, we found a way to sort of the perfect set of stages of where we wanted to be with each particular uh, stage of the mummy's development. Uh, through artwork, and then we started building maquettes and building statues of the heads and the and the uh, the models of the full bodies, uh, so that we could all agree and all know what it is that we were looking at. These are called maquettes, and they're a very faithful representation of the artwork, but carried into the third dimension. And this was acted as the color reference for all the CG artists later and the painters to play with light on this model, taking it into a 3D form was extremely valuable and a central part of the process. As you can see, it's, it's the most useful tool to get everyone to agree. It has all the little dangly bits and everything, the shininess, the color, all worked out here. And it's, uh, it's the next step in the evolution from the 2D artwork. We got that into three dimensions and we started sculpting it into our, in our model shop at ILM. Then we really got a sense of who this creature was. And we could take it to Steven and say, OK, here's your guy. What do you think? And when he said, that's, that's the guy I want in the film, then we started building him in the computer. Well, I think the thing that we've really, we've really tried to strive for as we've been working on this film is to take the things that we already know how to do and push those things forward and, you know, put things on the screen that are more complicated, more sophisticated, and more interesting than what we've seen before. Uh, human motion, you know, we're moving in that direction. We're trying to find ways of doing it better and better. It's amazing how much understanding of anatomy you end up with working on a show like this because, because it's got to be as real as you can make it. I mean, granted, it's a fantasy character. He's a monster. But it's got to be as real as you can get it. And, and, and that's one of the things that, that makes it believable. There's so much detail in creating a human form and, and movement. Uh, we know what a human looks like. We, we know how, how a human moves. And to make it convincing, you, you really have to get it right. And that was incredibly difficult. That required that we kind of work from the inside out. Uh, so my job on The Mummy was to, was to make all of that mechanics, all of that body mechanics of a human body work. So the first thing we would start with is the mechanics of movement of a human skeleton. Uh, normally you can, with a, with a character like, you know, maybe a T-Rex or, or Mars Attacks, the Martians, that kind of thing, you don't have to build a lot of excess complexity into the character. You can, you can pretty much use the simple case for shoulder joints, for elbows, for knees, for all those kinds of things. Uh, in our case, you were going to be able to see all the bones, so they had to move the way a real skeleton moves. So the very next step after the, the skeleton is getting the muscles to work correctly. Basically what we did is we took the, the, the skeleton, the, the correctly articulated skeleton, and we added the muscles onto it in such a way as that they connected up to the right places. Like we would connect the bicep to the right places on the arm, connect the forearm muscles, the, the brachioradialis, the, the triceps on the back would connect to the, to the scapula and to the back of the arm as well as down to the elbow. We just basically followed, you know, anatomy books, followed the assembly diagram, if you will. So the, the research and time involved to create this guy was, was astronomical, involving months of work. Uh, probably about two or three months for, for myself alone, plus uh, months of the people that were helping. This represents a kind of a, a kind of a hood open view of the mechanics of the musculature as we put it together. Um, each and every one of those little pin cushiony things, this is kind of the acupuncture version, each one of these pin cushion things represents, you know, some mechanism that twists or rotates or pushes or pulls or somehow deals with placing the muscle where it needs to be. One of the things we could not do with this particular creature is, is we didn't have the, the software as yet or the calculating power to, to figure out the collisions for each and every muscle surface against each and every other muscle surface. So rather than going and making something that was physically exactly scientifically accurate, we had to make something that looked 
physically and scientifically accurate, something that would fool the audience. I mean, it's movies after all. We're not making a medical film. So we just had to fool the audience into thinking that the muscles were moving and colliding and not you know, penetrating through each other and flexing and pulling and that kind of thing. This is kind of the, the completed muscul musculature on the, on the, uh, the character of Imhotep. Uh, as you can see, the, the, a lot of the muscles have been done fairly successfully, especially if you look in between his shoulder blades. You can see how as he pulls his arms back and so on, the, you get the bunching and stretching that you would really get on someone's back. Uh, his, his thighs flex accurately, his arms flex when he, when he rotates his, his wrist. You can see the forearm muscles all twist naturally around the bones. So we were pretty happy with this. This, this required, again, hours and hours, days and weeks of, of enveloping and tweaking how the, the muscles work. You know, we'd, we'd do a take and we'd see oh, one of the shoulder muscles twists inside out when he pushes his arm forward, and so we'd have to go in and fix that. And we'd run it again, and then we'd find some other little muscle that pops or jerks or turns sideways. Or, there was just, there's so many tiny little pieces that, that it required a lot of research and a lot of brute force, diligent, disciplined effort to get it all to work properly. Or at least, I mean, there's still flaws, to work convincingly. Okay, this was one of our first tests of our skinning software. This is software that was developed by John Anderson here. Uh, and basically what it does is it takes the outer skin of a creature and the skeleton of a creature and all the muscles that are inside and it fills that volume between the skin and the bones with virtual flesh. So what happens is, is that, is that the, that outer, the gray skin that you're seeing here is the outermost part of the, of the virtual flesh. The bones would be the innermost part. And then all the muscles, which I built and animated and made move properly, are embedded within that flesh. So what that gets us is that, is that the skin stays over the muscles and the bones without us having to do anything other than put it there. See, the, the movement on that gray skin, none of that's coming from any kind of animation other than procedural animation coming from the software. And this is, this is particularly fun if you, if you look right in the corner of the elbow. This is something that we weren't even necessarily expecting, but we got for free. You'll notice that it crinkles at the elbow, and it even kind of crinkles sort of like skin crinkles. You can see those three little those three little creases that form. And that just happens because the dynamics in the simulation the procedural animation are, are accurate. One of the trouble with conventional methods for creatures is that if you put lots of layers over top of each other and then move them around, they'll pop through and they'll, I mean, they'll show through and then they'll pull back and, and it really gives itself away as CG. Whereas with this, the skin stays over the, the muscles and the bones and you can actually see muscles and things sliding underneath the skin and we don't have to actually do it the hard way. We don't have to fake it. It just it just happens. When you're looking at creating something like that on a computer, you say, okay, are we going to build this as a model or are we going to paint some of this? And, you know, there are ways that we pushed, um, you know, I think the, the limits of what you can do in using not just the geometry but paint on top of that geometry to create what looks like more, more wrinkles and folds in the skin and it's actually painted so that you're in effect modeling using paint I suppose and so we were sort of doing things that were came pretty close to breaking the renderer in terms of the way that you actually create the final image for the screen it was it was we were riding the edge there that's for sure people at work were saying you guys are crazy I can't believe what you're doing as the project evolved uh, into the CG team's participation, uh, I would create more detailed artwork that would guide them in all of this detail, all of this uh, rotted, desiccated, webby stuff here. And this was uh, the work of, um, the collaborative work of the modelers and the view painters. Um, the view painters part played a really critical role in bringing all of this detail to life, and that's something that, that was really pushed on this creature more than just about anywhere else that I've seen, is this fusion of of computer geometry with more than just texture maps on top of it, but all of this webby transparent stuff being achieved in the view paint process with transparency maps and displacement maps to give it a, a 3D feel. It would have been far too time consuming and costly to model in geometry every one of these things in the computer, every one of these little strands. So a compromise had to be reached where certain larger muscle shapes were modeled in the computer and linked or rigged to the skeletal, the digital skeleton, and then the view painter came in and following this artwork as a, as a guide and inspiration would, uh, would 
hand paint, really sort of continue this concept painting digitally into the real creature itself, complementing the, the, uh, the, the muscle geometry. He has to be just as detailed on the inside as on the outside, the outside levels, as you go through, because you never know where he's going to be revealed or where he's going to turn or someplace that might be in shadow in real life that we'll, we'll pop a light into, enhance it, and make it more obvious that there's holes. We started out with a, uh, a really dense uh, creature, thinking that that's, we wanted him to appear as powerful and strong as we can. But once we started punching some holes in him and seeing through him, uh, we realized that was even more interesting. It gave him more mummy, scary creature feel. So then we started taking out his uh, you know, his lungs, his heart, and all the stuff that we had put in there originally because it was more interesting to be able to see through him. And still, with his, uh, his movement, make him look powerful. There you are! Be a good plate, hide and sneak! Come on, let's get out of here! Whoa! On The Mummy, we did a couple of really important things that I think are really true advancements in, in the uh, art of making uh, realistic motion and realistic uh, visuals on the screen that relate to human motion. Uh, we used motion capture very effectively to replicate the performance of Arnold Vosloo. At first, I was very worried that, you know, that, I, that, I'd, that I'd be able to sort of do what I was hired, which was to act amongst and amidst you know all the the special effects requirements because sometimes there were sort of physical parameters on what I could and couldn't do um, meaning I, I I had to do this stuff in in a certain way so that you could see the effects it's no good if my jaw was going to be rotted you know it's it's no good to play the scene like that you know so I had to I had to they had to place me sometimes physically and direct me. We spent two days with Arnold in motion capture replicating every scene in the film that he had done over the course of the previous six months where he needed to be driving the motion of the mummy creature and we had with us all of the background photography so that we could go and remind him of each scene and actually overlay on those scenes the motion capture animation at least in some rough form oftentimes just a skeleton but enough for us to see that yes this was going to fit into our backgrounds and it was going to work and for Steve Summers to just judge the performance that Arnold was giving him and say, okay, that's done, or let's do another take. So it was very much uh, kind of a replication of the action. And we had Steve there, and I was there, and we were trying to make sure that we had everything we needed in order to have a good foundation for animation. So we worked with Arnold really, really closely. I kind of just, you know, after the second or third day, I knew I was in such good hands, you know, not just on, on Steve Summers' side, but on, on John Burton and his ILM crew, that I just said, look, guys, sometimes I don't understand what it is that, that the effect's going to be because they almost have this other computer language that, you know, no one understands but them. And uh, I said, don't even bother explaining it to me. Just tell me to the, to the letter, to the T, what it is that you want me to do physically, you know, and... Uh, and once you set those parameters, then I'll inject whatever, you know, sort of performance I have to, uh, uh, you know, into that and, and to make it come alive, you know. So um, they're the best in the business. And, you know, once you, trust, uh, once you trust them, you can fly. Motion capture is where you take a uh, performer of some type and you track the various positions of their body using a computer to basically try to correlate in three-dimensional space uh, where they are and where the parts of their body are, which sounds like a lot of complicated gobbledygook. And, uh, but the, the basic way that it's done is that you use some kind of markers, either a magnetic tracker or a, uh, a, a little, it's kind of like a, a ping pong ball with reflective tape on it. And you can track that using uh, optical cameras. We use infrared cameras to bounce light off of these little tracking balls that are placed all over the uh, actor's body. And by using seven cameras in a big room, we can use the computer to correlate where each ball is. Seven cameras see a ball, they know that's the same ball. They can then triangulate 
uh, using relatively simple geometry to figure out where that ball is on any given frame. So as someone walks through a space with all these tracking markers all over them, what we do then is crunch all those numbers and what we end up with is a position of the knee, a position of the foot, a position of the elbow, a position of the shoulder, everywhere on his body and then we have our own software which constructs that back onto a skeleton and we can then reconstruct that motion in three dimensions and map just about anything we want onto it. It's the basis for which the animation is built. Um, it gives the uh, it gives the audience the feel that uh, the actor himself is the creature because you're, you're transferring his movement uh, into our, our, our CG environment. What we did here is we took the motion capture from Arnold and used that to make sure that our creature looked and acted and behaved like Arnold Vosloo. But we also then used our character animation skills and the fine animators that we have here at ILM to do the facial animation and the, the fine finger gestures and those sorts of things which are very difficult to capture. So we came up with a really tremendous synthesis of a new technology of capturing uh, data, if you will, of a performance of a, of a top flight first unit actor and melding that in with our top flight character animation skills and creating something on the screen that's some sort of synthesis of both of those. Mr. Burns, Prince Imhotep thanks you for your hospitality. Oh. And for your eyes. And for your tongue. Oh. But I'm afraid more is needed. Oh. The prince must finish the job and consummate the curse which you and your friends have brought down upon yourselves. To make the latter stages of the mummy uh, look really good, uh, we were directed to make sure that whatever we put on his face could not be done with prosthetic, and that was the challenge. And how we achieved that was uh, what you can't do with a prosthetic is just really uh, simulate holes in his face so that you could look through his skin and his cheek to the flesh, look through that and see the gums and teeth of the bone. And uh, none of that could be done with makeup and that was our challenge. It's very much a marriage of uh, makeup effects and computer graphics effects. It's kind of a new thing. It's uh, been done on several films in varying degrees here and there. But the idea of working really closely with a makeup artist, in this case it was Nick Dudman, who had just also worked on Star Wars, the, the, uh, the episode one stuff. So he was very much um, knowledgeable about what we could do, what he could do, and how those two things work together. We're both contributing to a single makeup where we're creating the mummy's physical changes that are plus to the actor's skin, and they're creating the physical changes that are minus to the actor's skin, which obviously we can't do without injuring the actor. And to do that, we've had to produce various pieces of hardware for ILM to their specification that fix, fix to the actor and enable the match movers to track his head in three-dimensional space on the set and place it into a computer. We worked really closely with Nick on a number of different projects within the film. He designed and built the suits for the soldier mummies, which the, we then replicated in computer graphics. He also helped us build tracking markers to go on Arnold's cheek and on his body, where we would be able to then use that information to help us take our computer graphics makeup and place it over exactly the place where we wanted to put it, vis-a-vis -vis Nick's makeup. So Nick is making up a lot of Arnold's head and down around here, and then right on the edge, he's putting this tracking marker, which allows us to track our computer graphics onto that spot. And so he worked with us very closely in terms of blending the edges and how we would put all our things together. It was incredibly helpful and great fun to work with. Uh, then when we got into post-production, then we took computer graphics and matched into what he was doing and then locked it onto Arnold's face, which was no small task, I can tell you, but made much easier by Nick's cooperation and his expertise. <laughs> Part of what makes movies great is that you can produce something on the screen that you could never see in reality. And we all have our imaginings of what the great plagues of the Bible were like, the locusts and the, uh, the, the flies and scarabs and the rivers running with blood and all this kind of stuff. But you never can see that. And in filmmaking, we can bring that to the screen. Look at this, sons of the pharaohs. 
Give me frogs, flies, locusts, anything but you. Compared to you, the other plagues were a joy. I'm so very sorry it was an accident. One of the things about Imhotep is that he has to be very powerful, very frightening, and, and filled with danger. Otherwise, he's not a very good villain, is he? So we sat down with Steve and worked out a whole bunch of things that we thought that he could do that would be really spectacular. Scarabs are really nasty little bugs, and, um, and some of them aren't so little. They come to life through, uh, I guess, the magic of ILM. Is, and, and you don't want to be anywhere near these things when they do come to life. We designed the, the scarab beetle from a hybrid of all sorts of nasty looking real insects. We made our own hybrid, super ugly, hungry beetle. They are sort of the minions of the mummy who run around devouring people in their path. Uh, and they have some adventures with the singular scarabs attacking people and some with uh, thousands and thousands of them chasing after everybody. Again, you know, the able to direct specific action with an animal and the ability to have many, many, many of them and have them work in relatively specific fashion is really what we were trying to do. They have to be creepy, mysterious, a little bit magical. These guys have been uh, uh, entombed for over 3,000 years and when the mummy wakes up, so do the massive quantities of scarabs. Um, and they do have kind of a, a magical element to them. They had to uh, be jet black but with a, a degree of sparkly iridescence, kind of a blue-pink iridescence. And uh, it was kind of tricky to create shaders and lighting that would work in a really darkly lit set of really black, uh, shiny objects. How do you make them black and dark but still look like they're responding to light uh, and have them be iridescent? So uh, the, the, the scarabs kind of have a threatening personality. This shot is um, one of the early shots in the film where we have our, our computer-generated scarab beetles. And in this case, uh, we've had the actor who's performing on, on the film set and, and we've got film footage of him writhing around in the bandages. What we've got to do is add some uh, scarab beetles to that. And so the first thing we need to do is match his movements. We create a computerised version of, of the mummified guy and um, have him moving around exactly like the guy did on set. And then we put little lines on him where some of our hero beetles are going to move. We've built a little scarab in the computer and we've painted that and created some material so that its skin looks all shiny and so it looks like a beetle. And we um, uh, have one of the animators has created a uh, run cycle for that guy. So what we do is map out where it will go on the, on the, on the um, man and we let it run along these paths. So that takes care of our heroes, but as you can see, we've got tons of these guys and, you know, more, more, more is what we were aiming for on this. And so uh, what we've done there is we've, we've taken a system where we represent each scarab by what we call a particle in a, in a particle system. And so we have all these little points that represent the scarabs falling out of the bucket here. And we've programmed them so that they'll just run round. They know about the, uh, the box here and they know about the body and they try and avoid it and each other. And so they end up creating this swarm of scarabs running over the guy. We uh, render those images out, which is what we call actually creating the final pictures, and we combine those with the original film of the guy. And it looks like the scarabs are crawling over his body. a plague of locusts that crashes across this desert and smashes through a wall and blows down on our heroes and cap, you know, just inundates them with these in, with incredible numbers of locusts. And of course, using the computer graphics technology, uh, we can actually not only create more locusts than you could ever wrangle or would want to, <laughs> and direct them to some kinds of specific actions to get exactly the look that we're looking for. So what we've got here is a plague of locusts that the mummy conjures up out of the desert. And in this case, each of the locusts is represented on our computer by a little particle in a particle system. And we take each of those and we 
apply what we call forces, different things to make them move and fly around and they avoid each other and then they're blown by the wind just so it doesn't look like, you know, a regular pattern. They'd actually shot this guy on location and um, they'd put all the locusts into a refrigerator to make them a bit dopey and then just put them all over his body. So when we got the plate, there was already quite a few just sitting there, but they weren't flying at all. So we've added in a whole heap here flying around. And there's actually a couple of real ones that jump off and you can't tell the difference. What have we done? He can even barf flies, which is great fun to watch. He releases a plague of flies into a marketplace where we have people running around, you know, scattering and trying to protect themselves from these bugs. We ended up replacing the, the whole lower half of, of, of the mummy's face, and uh, then we had to take that match him in the computer so we'd have some object so that the flies could actually, we'd know where they would come out of, and so that we could hide them behind down his throat as they well up here. Starting out with the very simplistic, let's say, point A to point B direction of the shot, the basic notion of a stream, could be water, could be anything coming out of someone's mouth. Then it's just a matter of adding um, randomness on top of that. And usually that's in the various forms of turbulence and noise are added to the, the motion. These uh, white squares represent uh, hundreds of flies. You can barely see him here. He's yellow. He shoots the flies out. It hits a window, and the flies go circling around a courtyard full of uh, people. They'd shot all these people railing around, but a couple of them weren't giving really the performances weren't that great, I guess. So selectively, the director asked us to cover up some of these guys with bigger clumps of flies and that sort of thing. He raises the desert by just lifting the sand off the floor of the desert, and it roils into these gigantic sandstorms just go racing across the desert, destroying everything in their path and he sends this out after uh, our heroes in the airplane and tries to bring them down with this giant sandstorm. Here's sort of just a fairly simple uh, wall of sand. It actually is, when I say fairly simple, it's, it's, it's a particle render. We've done a sim particle simulation using Maya software package. And so each um, grain of sand is represented by a particle in the computer. And we're able to change the color of that and add shadows and that sort of thing to try and look like it's a wall made of sand. So what we want to do is have the uh, mummy's face um, come out of that. What we've done here is uh, taken a model of the actor's head and digitized that and done some model work to, to make it match our needs. And an animator has uh, created some different face shapes and that sort of thing. In this case, we really wanted to elongate and stretch the face as it comes out of the sand, because it's supposed to be made of sand. So we um, added an extra set of controls that would allow us to really pull down on that and, and to really get these exaggerated expressions. From that, we create this uh, depth map, we call it. Essentially, it's a render of this where the nearest point comes out white and the farthest away point comes out black. And we can use this information with our particles that I showed earlier to create this image of the face in the sand. So here you can see a test where we've um, got essentially a fairly static for this example set of particles, each of these will be, when we've added the colouring and that sort of thing, will represent sand particles. And we've taken that image of the face and pushed that through here and we're actually able to affect what happens to the particles based on that image. So we can use that in the actual final stage where we take the particles and render them to give a gross um, uh, shape of the face and then we can also use it in our particle simulation that's creating the action of the sand so that it looks like the sand is being distorted by the, uh, the uh, face as it emerges. And then the uh, result of all that is this um, final image of a face emerging from the sandstorm. There's a sort of awkwardness in doing special effects where clearly you're not working with any acting partner. But then again, there's some advantages to it. The awkward bits is you may think that you're overacting, throwing your jaw open and screaming and expecting 
someone to come and take away my union card, but uh, when you see the end result, obviously there's a creature that's put in there and whatever response you gave is entirely appropriate. You have to think of how the actors or the stunt doubles are going to react to the CGI images. So you work closely, again, with the visual effects people um, to see what they need and especially what they don't need. You know, it's, it's very difficult sometimes because you've got to know how things are, are going to react and you've got nothing to react to. An advantage to working with someone who's not there in this case was our sequence at the end, which is an homage directly to Ray Harryhausen in the skeleton fight from Sinbad, uh, when um, Rick uh, takes on a room full of mummies. Setna. <laughs> Brendan was really great at being able to understand the sorts of things that we were bringing to the screen. He'd worked on George of the Jungle, so he knew a bit about how to work with synthetic creatures that aren't there when you are. And uh, he did some incredible fight scenes, which end up being him alone with 12 computer-generated creatures. And when you see these scenes, and you see him fighting against something that's not even there with real strength and real power, boy, that made our job a lot easier. To create the effect, uh, I learned a choreography with a bunch of stuntmen shot two passes with motion capture control cameras. And uh, of course, the stunt players were removed. John Burton from Industrial Light and Magic inserted uh, uh, mummies. He was able to bring that physical power to the screen and hit the marks that we wanted them to hit with the motion control cameras flying all over everywhere. And uh, that really allowed us to take our digital creatures and put them right in there with him. And they look and act like they're in the same space. I could swing a sword right through plain air instead of like having to pull my punch for uh, a stuntman because obviously you wouldn't want to injure someone. So the effects are just so much more fluid and engaging. Brandon in that particular take was really good. He was, uh, he hits his cues really well and uh, I think he acted the, the shot so well for us that we really could feed off his, uh, his actual performance. So basically we, we uh, we got the action of Brandon uh, defined um, by rehearsing with, with different stunt people to, to get every single uh, character, you know, cued in in terms of where Brandon would be spatially in relation to each and respective mummy. And then, um, and then also have a sense of uh, the flow of the action. And then uh, each uh, stuntman that was used to rehearse was actually put into a, a motion capture suit. Um, on set and every single individual mummy was captured uh, remotely. So basically what you're looking at right now is like a combination of 21 different characters that have been added, uh, captured and added one after another in the shot to sink in the action of, uh, of Brandon. So it's, a, it's really a combo of different techniques, procedural animation, um, motion capture, data gathering and then lots of keyframe animation to get the performance right. And, and the way we wanted it. Mummies. There's two things we can do with the digital mummies. We can eat bits away of them so that they couldn't possibly ever have been played by a human. And the other thing we can do is chop them up. Here I've just got a pretty crude animation that I did. This gives you the general idea of, um, of, of the mummy just being hit by uh, our hero. Well, we've really got two mummies here, one of whom flies off and the other whom, which is left standing here. What we've done is um, using lighting and uh, different types of texture maps and different a variety of computer techniques, we've actually had to create what's left behind and set it up so that we can easily go from this intact guy to this guy in two halves. The things that we're gonna, we'll add to this are obviously flying dust and bits of mummy stuff that fly all over the place to, to uh, finish the effect off. What was fun about this shot is that Stephen wanted something that was really um, dramatic, uh, very action driven, but also very, very funny. So on the set, we had license to actually drive the performance of the characters. We pushed the, the uh, cartoony um, aspect of the animation by fine-tuning the animation to uh, match precisely eye direction, head directions, arms, and added some, some extra motion on the characters to be able to get them to do what we wanted. <laughs> This 
scary thing. You may somewhere in the back of your mind believe that it can't be real, but there's nothing on the screen that gives it away. You do believe it's real. And it's only if you decide to step away and realize you're sitting in a seat with a bucket of popcorn on your lap that it can't be real. But for that first moment during that gasp, you're buying it 100%. And uh, that's, I think, the key moment for any visual effects artist to, to be able to grasp the audience that way. I think it's a um, really good combination of what we can bring to uh, filmmaking as a visual effect artist in terms of the, the variety in the scope of, uh, of the work we've done and also breaking new ground and uh, raising the audience expectation to a new level. If it's a groundbreaking and it, and it looks good, the audience is going to love it. And if it uh, tells the story, the director's going to like it. They all kind of tie, tie together. Um, you want people to go, wow, be they the director or the audience, or us, actually. I mean, you do want to have a challenge, that's for sure. I mean, that's what keeps it interesting, you know, always trying to make it better and better. We will always be relying on actors to set the marks for what performance should be. And you're not going to be able to make a movie that's got performance that's the equal of great actors by using something that's not great actors. The technology is by far and away more advanced than I'm able to really accurately describe, knowing exactly what goes on. But um, I'm, I feel quite at home with it, to tell you the truth. Um, it's a very collaborative experience for me, and it's, it's one that I, that I love about filmmaking. I thought the special effects were just amazing. I'd, I'd had to imagine what this rotting mummy would look like, and my imagination was is very boring in comparison to what they came up with. Um, um, it's just I mean, incredible. Everybody seems to be very surprised by the movie, and I think they weren't expecting what we give them. Working with Stephen Summers has been you know, like one of the greatest experiences of my life as a filmmaker. Uh, he's just got tremendous enthusiasm for everything that he's working on. And we have tremendous enthusiasm for the things that we want to bring to him. And the more that he's enthusiastic about the work that we're doing, the more we're enthusiastic about the work that he's doing. And it's been a really great collaboration. I think he's, he's just so enthusiastic to be making this picture because uh because why, who knows? It's, he's, he's constantly going, he has boundless energy. He's got more energy than, than, I've never met a human being with quite that much energy. He's really bouncy, happy, um, inspiring, fun. Uh, he's just made the whole, the whole shoot really easy and fun. He loves these kind of like big roller coaster films and he knows how they work and he knows how he wants to write them and he knows how he wants to make them. So he's, he's just like, you know, like a big kid. I think he's he's truly supremely talented, and and uh, um, he's going to go on to great things. And and it was, it's certainly the most comfortable I'd ever been working with a director. Just for some, you know, some reason we just clicked. All the actors in this movie were just um, not only were they good actors, but they were all sweethearts, and that makes make a movie like this, the size of it, the complexity of it. Um, the difficulty of the whole thing, it really made it wonderful to work with these people. Well, everybody always asks, you know, when are actors going to be put out of work by digital technology? And I always have the same answer, which is never. <laughs> we have such a tremendous challenge ahead of us to try to create a digital actor that can perform the way a real actor can perform. And I have no doubt that the more that we start pushing uh, digital performance, the more that we will A, rely on real performance, and B, the real performers, being human beings, will rise to the challenge and will create performances that we can't hope to replicate in digital technologies. That's just the way it works. Reality has a complexity that is infinite. And until we come up with a computer that is able to calculate an infinite number of numbers, there's no way we're going to touch it.